Good morning. Welcome back to Salem Lutheran Church in Afton, Missouri. My name is Pastor Wayne Hebner, and it's time for our Tuesday morning Bible study. Today we are pleased to have in person some of our Bible study participants, so we welcome all of you who are here in the sanctuary this morning, and those of you who are joining us online over Facebook Live, and those of you who are participating in the Bible study by the audio stream as heard on our telephone ministry. My name is Pastor Wayne Hebner. I serve here at Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. With me this morning is Vicar Brett Jones and Mr. John Whitmere, and they are in the balcony this morning, and they will relay any comments or questions that folks at home have on Facebook Live. You can uh, put those in the feed, and uh, they'll relay them down to us. And we also look forward to a lot of stimulating questions, comments, and discussion from the folks gathered here in person. We are able again to meet uh, socially distanced, behind masks and all of that, but it's good to have people in the pews for our Tuesday morning Bible study. We are continuing a look at the miracles of Jesus, and today is our third lesson. It's our second miracle. Today we're going to talk about how Jesus heals a paralyzed man. It's a familiar account, and we hope that we find some things that the Holy Spirit leads us to know and recognize that perhaps we haven't uh, learned before. So we invite you to join us for the next hour or so as our hearts are directed to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as recorded by the physician, St. Luke. Let's begin our day with a short word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are indeed the great physician and the healer of body and soul. As we continue our look at the miracles, the miraculous signs that you performed and are recorded in the Holy Scriptures, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts to see you as God's Son and our Savior, that we might believe in you all the more firmly as the one who has overcome the sickness and disease of death itself, so that we might live with you forever. We pray your blessing upon our time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, welcome back, those of you who are here in person. You should have received a copy of the outline for the week, and I think that will also be displayed on the right-hand side of the screen uh, with the Facebook feed. So if you're watching online, you can follow along that way. And those of you here in person should also have received a yellow sheet, and that has the text of today's scripture reading. It's from Luke chapter 5. So we're going to Luke chapter 5 in your Bible, and we'll take a look at verses 17 through 26. The yellow sheets that I printed, the Bible that I'm using today, is uh, the New International Version 1984 edition. And that's the uh, Bible version that's familiar to most of our Tuesday morning Bible study participants. It's also the um, Bible version that was used when this study was created. Uh, we'll be following that, but if you have another version of the Bible that is familiar to you, you're certainly welcome to use that. Any translation of the Bible uh, is just fine. Okay, well, what have we learned so far? We talked in the beginning of our discussion two weeks ago about what miracles are. And I don't know if anybody remembers our definition, but it uh, has to do with a work of God that goes outside the natural order of things. And that's a specific definition of what a miracle is. It's a theological definition of a miracle. I think sometimes, especially as Christians, we perhaps use that word in a different way. Um, I think sometimes people ascribe things that happen in an ordinary way, in the natural way, uh, to God and consider them miraculous. Uh, so for example, if you have a bad headache one night and then the next morning you wake up and your headache is gone, you can say, well, it's a miracle. You know, God healed my headache. Um, and maybe it's because you took ibuprofen or some other medication or something like this that the pain is gone. Now, that certainly is a work that can be ascribed to God and we know that God is the one who makes and preserves and takes care of our lives. 
But by our definition, I don't know if that would qualify as a miracle because in the natural order of things, uh, we see how medication and treatment and therapy can bring healing to our bodies and our minds. So if you think of it as um, two concentric circles, uh, make a bigger circle out here and then put a smaller circle inside. And we'll take the big circle and we'll label that works of God, things that God does. And then inside the works of God, we'll put miraculous signs or miracles so that every miracle is also an act of God, but not every act of God is miraculous by this sense. When you see the sunrise every morning and the, you know that the planets and the stars are in their heavens and, and everything is right with the world, you might say, well, that sunrise is a miracle. Um, you know, it's beautiful. It's a work of God. He's the one who's ordering all things, but he's doing that through the natural order. And I don't know that a, a sunrise would qualify as a miracle because it, it happens every day. That's the way things work. Now, of course, uh, in the book of, uh, gosh, is it Joshua or Judges now? I forget. When the sun stood still, isn't that in Joshua? Uh, and the day didn't finish, uh, that was a miraculous work of God, a miracle, because uh, the natural order wasn't followed and the day was prolonged. God can do anything. He doesn't always tie himself to the natural order. When he doesn't, that's when we have miracles. So we looked at the first of Jesus' miraculous signs last week. Of course, there are many miracles in the Old Testament. We're focused more in this study on the New Testament miracles of Jesus. And the first one, of course, was that uh, miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee. Vicar Brett did a great job of leading us last week as we talked about how Jesus turned the water in those large stone vessels into the finest wine that anyone had ever tasted and uh, made for a pretty nice wedding reception. <laughs> I'm sure that was one for the ages. So there you see how Jesus took water and as it was poured out of those big stone vessels, it had turned to wine. Now that's not something that normally happens in the natural order. We saw also that it was not a miracle uh, done simply to dazzle the audience, like a parlor game or a parlor trick, but it was designed to draw attention to who Jesus is, that in him we have this new wine, this new uh, uh, manifestation of God's promises and blessings. We call it the New Testament. And also that Jesus' disciples could put their faith in him as the Son of God. So that was the end of uh, the miracle in John chapter 2, the first of his miraculous signs he did at Cana in Galilee, and his disciples put their faith in him. So that was the purpose, real purpose, of the miracle. Okay, today we're going on to something that uh, maybe isn't quite as familiar as the wedding in Cana, although it is certainly a familiar miracle. And this is the one where Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Now there are many times in the Gospels where we see Jesus heal people with physical afflictions like leprosy or blindness or deafness. This man happened to be paralyzed. He couldn't walk. And you may recall that he had some friends who brought him to Jesus in a most unusual way. We'll talk about how they made sure that their friend could get up close and personal with Jesus. Uh, I should mention uh, at the beginning, we'll be looking at this account in Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26. This same miracle is also recorded in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 to 8. And I can't read my own writing here, which I wrote yesterday. Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. But I think the reason that the editors of this study picked the Luke account, well, there might be a couple of reasons. First of all, Luke's the physician. 
So anytime you have a miracle of healing, Luke is your go-to guy in the Gospels. He tends to have an eye for some of the details in medical conditions and so on. But also, Luke's account is the most detailed in this regard of the three accounts. He has a longer explanation and description of what happened than either Matthew or Mark. So that's why we're focused on Luke. It's a wonderful place to be in the Bible. So why don't we go to the study guide, and if you have it with you, you can follow along here in person. If you are studying at home on Facebook Live, you should be able to see this on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll look first at the focus section this is right under the beginning of the lesson, and it would be page 12, if that means anything to you, uh, those of you here in person. So uh, it's a little bit difficult. <laughs> I know the people here in church are wearing masks, and I could have them read. Uh, if we were meeting in person uh, without an online audience, I think I would do that. But I'll do the reading today simply so that those of you at home can hear more clearly and follow along. But again, if you had any comments or questions as we go along here in person, you can raise your hand. We'll try to get to you. And also, if you have questions at home, just put those in the Facebook feed and we'll get to them as well. Let's read the focus section. You look at your best friend. You can tell that something is terribly wrong. Her face reveals pain and anxiety. She's just returned from the doctor. The diagnosis was bad. She has a deadly disease. You listen to her, pray with her, and promise to do everything you can to help. As she leaves, you can't help wondering if there's anything you can do that will help her. Now, sadly, this is all too familiar to a lot of us. I suppose as we get older, especially, we will have friends, family members, and loved ones who have moments like this, and we are part of them. The first question today as we start to focus our attention on this uh, account, what would you do to help a close friend or family member who faced a diagnosis like this? What could you do to help? Those of you here in person, you want to think that over and offer any suggestions? Don, what do you think we could do? Yeah. I mean, praying for the person and praying with the person, I mean, most people say, well, at least I can pray for you. No, that's the most important. Yeah, that's a great observation by Don. Um, he said that everything that's described here is excellent. You, you listen to the person, you pray with the person, and then you offer to help in any way that you can. And Don observes, rightly, I think, that a lot of times people treat that uh, prayer as a last resort or the minimum. Well, you know, at least I can pray for you. And Don says, no, no, that's the most important thing you can do uh, right off the top. So good. Um, some nuts and bolts, very simple things. I know you don't have the benefit of the uh, leader's guide that I do, and I've got some suggestions here, but I just want to see if there's anything else. I mean, real simple things that you can do to help somebody. Think, for example, about the COVID uh, time when so many people are confined to their homes. How are we helping our neighbors? Dave, what did you come up with? Yeah, shopping. You can go to the grocery store. Yeah, uh, particularly now, we know that many people who have compromised immune systems are not able to leave their homes. Uh, they don't feel comfortable doing that, but boy, what a godsend to be able to have someone go to the grocery store. And if you do it for free, it's a lot more affordable than DoorDash or Instacart, right? Uh, you can uh, pick up the groceries and deliver them to someone's house. Yeah, Don. One, it's beneficial to me, but it's also I enjoy, my neighbor, she's 93 years old, and she doesn't get out much, she can't drive anymore, and I just call up as an office. I get older, and I'm sure she's worse than me because she doesn't have, she doesn't have the ability to even get out and, like, walk her dog, like, walk my dog, and stuff like that, or she can't even do that. So, 
Yeah, Don says that we can, we can call someone on the telephone, we can talk. I know in talking to a lot of our folks who are listening by telephone this morning and participating in the Bible study, that they call each other. I know they do because they tell me they do. And uh, it's a great way to stay in touch with people. Uh, sometimes we forget, you know, the telephone today is probably considered uh, uh, old fashioned technology. You talk to uh, people younger than a certain age and they still talk about their cell phones, but many younger people don't use their cell phones as telephones anymore and actually talk. But uh, if you're confined to your home and you've got a lot of time on your hands, telephone can be a great way. In the interest of time and just moving things along, I'll give you some of the other things that are suggestions. And some of these obviously are more um, dramatic, uh, more of a commitment, but things that I'm sure you've heard of other people doing when you find someone who has a diagnosis. Uh, you can help with that person's care, driving someone to a doctor's appointment, prepare meals, run errands, we've talked about that. Uh, sometimes, in extreme cases, you might even give blood or donate bone marrow. If you have a family member, I, I've heard of that too, where someone has a disease that requires a close match from someone who's genetically related. So you could do something as, as um, extreme as giving a particular blood type or particular type of bone marrow. I thought about raising money for bills and uh, typical fundraisers, maybe there's a dinner or a dance or something like that. You see that especially in small towns, I suppose. Uh, today we have, I'm not sure how many of our participants are familiar with this, but in, an online fundraising platform called GoFundMe. Maybe you've heard about that. Uh, people can contribute to certain projects online. And another one in the study guide is support research for a cure. You'll see this a lot of times when people have family members, especially children who are stricken with a particular disease, uh, they become strong advocates and supporters for many of the fine organizations that do research and raise funding uh, for treatments and cures. Now let's take a look at number two. And again, <laughs> this is always um, a little bit dangerous territory, I suppose, but put yourself in the place of God or put yourself in the place of our Lord Jesus. How would you feel if your efforts were directly responsible for the cure? Now, I don't know that any of us has ever been in that situation, but can you imagine if someone had a deadly disease and it was something you did that was able to cure that person? Uh, how would you feel about that? What would that be like, David? I would be extremely happy, but I myself would thank God for all the best. Yeah, so Dave says he'd be very happy, but he recognizes it's not me that did it, it was God. So if you're a doctor or you're a, a bone marrow donor or something, you recognize, you know, it's not me that made this happen, but it's God working through me. Yeah, very good. I've got joy, gratitude, and as Dave said, as a Christian, praise to God. Um, I remember that. I forget that movie. Uh, you can tell how old I am because all my movie references come from like the 1970s and 80s. But uh, I don't even remember what movie it was. It's just one line sticks out to me. Some of you remember Alec Baldwin, famous actor. Alec Baldwin played a cardiologist. He was a heart surgeon and uh, he was upset about something that happened in the operating room because somebody questioned what he was doing and he came out of the surgery and he said, when I'm in that operating room, I'm God. <laughs> and that was his character. Um, uh, you know, obviously he's not, right? He's Alec Baldwin, but uh, we should never presume that we're the ones who, who are responsible for that. We're gonna go to Mr. Whitmayer up in the balcony waving his arm and he has a comment or question from home. There we go. We just have a couple of comments to the questions that you've been asking. Um, Sandy talks, uh, like we have said before, about uh, checking on our elderly neighbors. Um, and Addie also says, don't wait for the person to suggest something, be proactive. Um, and then in answer to question number two, Addie also says she'd pre feel proud but humble, thankful to God. Yeah, thankful to God. I think that's a, a Christian attitude. Yeah, that's... Uh, I forget if it was Sandy or Addie who made the suggestion that instead of saying, um, 
let me know if there's anything I can do for you. That kind of puts the onus on the other person. Rather say, what can I do to help? Let me know how I can help you. So you're already committed to helping. You just need to know what you want me to do. Point me in the right direction. Okay, well, why don't we read this uh, short little account in Luke chapter 5. And we'll read the whole thing straight through. And then we'll go back and uh, take a look at it piece by piece. So I'm reading Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. One day as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. It's a nice little account. Uh, Luke is such a great storyteller. He captures some of the detail and the mood of the scene. And uh, there's that triumphant uh, result at the end where the man is healed and everyone praises God. Let's back up now to Luke chapter 5, verse 17. This was the opening verse in the account. And uh, verse 17 says, One day as Jesus was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. That's a long verse. Uh, Number one on the inform section Uh, says, Luke tells us that many people had come to see Jesus on this day. Who was in the crowd and what did they want? Uh, Anybody tell me anything about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Those of you here in person. Art, who were those guys? The Pharisees are a sect of Judaism which uh, believes in miracles, they believe in angels, and they believe, and this is the the kicker here in the world, The resurrection from the dead. Yes, good. Yeah, Art is spot on. The Pharisees are a sect of Judaism. Remember, not all the Jews believed and taught the same things, even among the religious leaders. And the Pharisees were, um, I've often compared them to the populist conservatives. I use that uh, term a little bit uh, uh, hesitatingly these days, but uh, they were certainly committed to God's word. And as Art rightly pointed out, they believed in the one true God. They believed in the supernatural, in miracles, in angels, and even the resurrection from the dead. Jesus never had a problem on those issues with the Pharisees, but he sure had a lot of problems with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law because they had a hard time seeing in Christ Jesus their Lord and their God. So what did they want? Well, some came to this house in search of healing, but as is so often the case, others came to see who Jesus was and what he was teaching to check things out, and if you are predisposed not to like Jesus, to catch him in something that he might say that you didn't agree with. And it reminds me, um, uh, 
It's not only President Trump or President-elect Biden, but any, any president. You know, we get these press conferences. The press is, is just like a, a bunch of sharks circling in the water. They're waiting for any moment of weakness, and they're going to come in and, and try to trap you in your words. Pastor Whitmare in the back. Yes. Yeah. Well, these scribes and Pharisees were arguing about Jesus. They were arguing amongst themselves, who's going to pay for the hole in the roof? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pastor Whitmer says the Lutherans were in the back of the room arguing about who's going to pay for the hole in the roof. Yes. Uh, but the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were there to try to trap Jesus in something that they thought might be considered blasphemous. Art. I notice that in, in the gospel, in the text, they are distinguishing between the Pharisees and the, teach, and the teachers of the law. Are the teachers of the law to be equated with some other group? Or were they simply teachers of the law on the sides of the Pharisees? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a real expert in that. Art's asking if there's a distinction between the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Are those two different groups? Boy, I, um, if only we had a vicar here who could help us out with these things. I, I think they're called Venn diagrams. You ever see where there's two circles and they interlock? And if you have a blue circle and a yellow circle and you put them together so they kind of overlap, then you have that green wedge where they're connected. So now you have a blue section, a yellow section, and a green section. I'm going to take a, a wild guess and say, if you make the Pharisees blue and the teachers of the law yellow, there's a place in the middle where they're green. So again, not all Pharisees are, t are uh, teachers of the law, not all teachers of the law are Pharisees, but there were probably some who were both. I'm thinking that's a good answer, and I don't see Vicar Brett objecting, so he's going to nod his head and say, yeah, I agree with that, but I might be way off. I don't know. That's just a guess. Uh, Don. Yeah, so the, the circles will interlock, but there's still a place on, on either side. Okay, let's move on then and take a closer look at verses 18 to 20. Now, I won't read this whole thing because these verses tend to get long. But if you look at verses 18 to 20, this is where we are introduced to the men carrying the paralytic on a mat. And I was going to double check this, but I, I think the idea is that there are four friends and each has a corner of the mat. So there's five guys total, one's on the mat, they each have a, a corner. And I didn't, I didn't look at Matthew or Mark, but I'm thinking that's where we find that. Um, they couldn't find a way to get through the front door, so they climbed up to the roof, and as Pastor Whitmer said, they tore apart the roof tiles and then lowered this mat down by ropes so that their friend could be right there in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Uh, so number two says one person could not get in to see Jesus. His friends carried him, but it was still impossible to gain entrance. How did they finally get him in? Well, they climbed up on the roof and let him down through the hole. Here's a good question. How do you think the crowd reacted to this? Now, there was some discussion in some of the places I looked about what kind of roof these homes had. And apparently the more modest homes of the Jews were simple palm fronds and then they, they put mud over that and it kind of baked in the hot sun and it, it got uh, firm, firm enough for a roof. So you have these longer um, pieces of branch or leaf. If it were a Roman house, which implies someone perhaps who was a little bit wealthier, uh, maybe a larger house that you couldn't just throw some branches and mud up there, they would actually have a structure that was tiled in. 
Uh, if you've ever been to Salem Lutheran here in Afton or other churches, you can look at our roof. <laughs> and by God's grace, our roof is still holding strong some 60 years or so, 70 years after it was put up. But um, there are overlapping tiles, and when we need to make a repair, the repair people have to take those tiles off one at a time, layer by layer, to get down to the, the uh, subroofing underneath. And I think perhaps that's what Luke is describing here, is a roof of a house that's a little bit larger, a little more ornate, and they, they still tore these things apart. But what's going to happen when they tear the roof apart? What happens underneath? <laughs> you know, you're going to get dirt and debris and stones and dust, and all of this is coming down on the people in the house. So you can imagine them doing something like this and shielding themselves. It's a bit of a shock not only to see dirt and debris coming from the ceiling, but then to see a hole open up and a uh, bed or a cot being lowered down by four ropes. This must have been something to see indeed. One person who doesn't seem phased by this at all is Jesus of Nazareth. What did he first do for the paralyzed man? And how do you think the man reacted to what Jesus did. Now this is an important part of this miracle account. What is the first thing Jesus said to the man who was lowered down in front of him? Do you remember? Your sins are forgiven. Now does that strike you as odd? <laughs> you know, it might, but then again knowing Jesus, it might not. Why would he say your sins are forgiven? It's his way of healing him. What's Jesus' priority? Art? Well, it is, of course, uh, the healing of the guilt of sin. But could it be that this guy who was there and paralyzed had a sense that because of his sin, he was struck by paralysis? It's possible. Art asked the question, was it, was it conceivable that this man thought that his sins were the reason that he had been paralyzed. Um, the Jews seemed to have this uh, mindset. Remember they asked Jesus one time, who sinned that this man was, uh, was it born blind, I think? You know, did his parents do something wrong or did he do something wrong? It was God punishing them. And Jesus turned that way of thinking on its head. He said, no, that's not how these things work. If you happen to have a child that has a physical or mental disability, or sometime later in life you suffer a, a disability or a debilitating disease, it's not because of anything you did wrong. Now, of course, if you eat potato chips and drink milkshakes every day for dinner, you might have some heart disease in your future. But it's not like God strikes people down and punishes them for specific sins that they've done wrong. It just doesn't work that way. We all live in this fallen creation under the curse of sin and death. So this man was not being punished by God. But here's a question I, I wanted to consider as we answer this one. I think David hit at this a little bit. He was healing a man, but his first priority, Jesus' first priority was this man's soul. Uh, you could, I mean, Jesus could have healed the guy and sent him on his way, but does that do him any good in the eternal scheme of things? Perhaps not. So first he wanted to make sure that this man's soul was healed, and then later he took care of the body. A couple of things for you to consider. I, I've never heard anybody ask this, but I have thought about this in my life many times as I read this account again and again. I know that Jesus was healing, and that was why so many people in the crowd came to him. And it is likely that that's why the men brought this guy to see Jesus, because they had this man and they were hoping that he would heal his paralysis. But what if it's possible that they were so mature in their faith that that wasn't what they were looking for? That the reason they let him down through the roof is they couldn't get through the front door. And they were hoping to hear Jesus teach and offer this message of forgiveness. 
And because the man happened to be paralyzed, they couldn't get him in any other way. So they used the handicapped entrance, right? They dropped him through the roof. And would they and would this man have been satisfied if all he received from Jesus was this message, your sins are forgiven? That would have been enough, right? He could have gone on his way. Now he still would have been paralyzed, but his greatest need would have been met. And perhaps that's what uh, his friends were looking for. I don't know. I've never heard any other commentator say that, but it's something that I've thought of in my own mind. Now, Jesus certainly took the opportunity to uh, not only uh, to work on this man's heart and on his body and the, the faith of his friends, but also to the crowd there and to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He used this as a teaching moment, didn't he? So let's go on and uh, see what comes next. Uh, Jesus probably surprised the man, I think that's a fair statement, uh, by saying your sins are forgiven. If we look at verses 21 to 23 and number four on the study guide, the paralyzed man wasn't the only one who was surprised. Who else? Well, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They began thinking to themselves, in verse 21, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? All right. Uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were also surprised. And what did they think was wrong? They thought Jesus was blaspheming. Blasphemy. Think about that word from the Old Testament. It's not a word that we use real often in today's world. But blasphemy is what? A false claim that you are God or a false claim that you are doing something that only God can do or you are teaching something falsely in conflict with God's word. I think, is that a good definition of blasphemy, Art? A Greek word, okay. And, uh, this was used as a cudgel, not just for Jesus, but also for people like Socrates or, Di uh, or Diogenes, who taught different stuff or were perceived as teaching different stuff, and their enemies accused them of blasphemy. Okay, so Art says it's not only a religious term, it's a secular term, and you mentioned Socrates and Di Diogenes. Um, who were accused by their detractors of being blasphemous because they said things and uh, taught things differently from other people. So it is a Greek term then that comes into English and they uh, accuse Jesus of being blasphemous. Let's look at number five and see why did the Pharisees think it was blasphemous. For Jesus to forgive sins, that's the real sticking point, that he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, they said in verse 21, they asked a rhetorical question, one that doesn't really expect an answer, who can forgive sins but God alone? And it was understood that only God can forgive sins. And there are a couple of uh, references here in the study guide to this. If we look back at the Old Testament book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, as a penalty, he, uh, average run-of-the-mill Israelite who came to uh, the tabernacle, uh, must bring to the priest, that is, to the Lord, his guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him before the Lord, and he will be forgiven for any of these things he did that made him guilty. This is a description of the guilt offering, the offering for guilt. When you did something wrong, you sinned against God, you brought this ram as a sacrifice, and through it, notice what the law of Moses said, the priest offered it to God, but it was God then who forgives your sins. And if we go all the way to the back of the New Testament, and we find the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. This is a powerful statement here. Uh, verse 22, it says, The law requires 
that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You needed to have a perfect ram as a sacrifice. You needed to shed blood to pay for sins. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So you start to connect the dots now. Who's the perfect ram? Who's going to offer a sacrifice? Who's going to shed his blood? From our perspective, as New Testament Christians, we see these Bible passage already, uh, Bible passages already talking about Jesus. The Pharisees might have thought Jesus was blaspheming, but we know, we can see after the fact, that he was not. He was telling the truth when he said, your sins are forgiven. Number six, the Pharisees thought that Jesus was wrong, but they didn't speak their objections. If you look carefully at verse 21, look at what it says. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began to do what? To think to themselves. Now, in the Greek, there's a word and it's uh, pronounced something like diologeo. It's the word from which we get dialogue. You know what dialogue is? A conversation, a back and forth. But you can also have a dialogue in your head with yourself. It's called thinking, <laughs> right? And some of us may be better at it than others. Some of us probably don't do it as much as we ought to. But if you say to yourself, self, and then you have a conversation in your mind, that's diologeo, that's dialoguing in your brain. They didn't necessarily talk to each other out loud about this in front of the crowd, but Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew what was in a man, right, or a woman, because he is the omniscient son of God. He knows all things. When you see that in verse 22, it, it says just that, right? He says he knew what they were thinking. Now, we're going to do some connecting the dots here. All right. If Jesus knew what they were thinking, and only God is omniscient, only God can see in our minds, what does that tell you about Jesus? Jesus. He's God, right? Okay, good. Logic. Uh, good. We're not moving too fast for, for anybody, especially me here. So if Jesus, if, if only God knows everything and Jesus knew what was in their hearts, therefore he must be God. If he's God, he can also do other things that only God can do, which includes what that they were so upset about? Forgiving sins, right? If he knew what was going on in the minds of the Pharisees, then he must be God. And if he's God, well then, yeah, he can forgive sins. And that's what he's going to try to demonstrate to the audience there, especially the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Let's move on then. And we're going to take a closer look at uh, verses 22 and 23. And he has this little conversation. He knew what they were thinking, and he said, well, why do you think in your heart uh, all this stuff about blasphemy? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk? Now think about that. That's a, a pretty easy question to answer. What would be easier for a religious teacher to say to a man who was paralyzed, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Which one's easier? Your sins are forgiven. Why is that an easier thing to say? They can say whatever they want. Nobody knows what's going on inside, right? You can't see someone's soul. You can't see whether this teacher is really forgiving sins or not. But walking, you know, that's not something you can fake. If they knew this guy and they knew he was paralyzed, uh, to say get up and walk is a lot harder than simply saying your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is going to use this little example now to show who he is and what he's all about. 
And we look at verse 24. We're getting up now to number seven in the study guide. Uh, we have Jesus answering the Pharisees' objections, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Again, we talked about this last week. The, uh, the wedding at Cana, you know, there was a real problem. They ran out of wine, and that's a real problem. But I think Vicar Brett did a nice job last week of showing us that that earthly dilemma was an opportunity for Jesus to display his Godhead and teach a spiritual lesson so that they put their faith in him as the Son of God. Here's the same thing. This man is paralyzed. That's an earthly affliction. But Jesus is going to use it as a way to show that he's God, that he has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus demonstrated then, in number seven, that he has the authority to forgive sins. And how, does it, how do you see the proof in that? I mean, it, it, it's no surprise what happened to the guy. He got up, right? He could take his mat and he could walk. And the fact that he was healed physically demonstrates that Jesus had already healed him spiritually. Now, to go back to my question I asked earlier, was this guy ever seeking to be healed? I think he probably was. But even if he wasn't, now he gets this bonus. Not only is, are his sins forgiven, he can walk. He can take his mat and go home. If we look at number eight, how did people react to this miracle? And this now would be verse 26. Um, after immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. It's the end of verse 25. So uh, let's start with the first person involved here. How did the man who was healed react to this miracle? What does the text say he did? He praised or thanked God. Yes, he praised or thanked God. And it's an interesting word. I want to just double check to make sure I've got it right. Um, I looked this up yesterday. And the word there is to, uh, yeah, to give glory to God. To give glory to God. Meaning recognizing that God is has his divine glory as God, here recognizing that Jesus himself is God and is worthy and deserving of being glorified in the same way that we would, we would uh, glorify God the Father. So the man who was healed praised God, glorified God. This detail is only in Luke's account, by the way, that he gave glory to God. How about the other people around? The people, literally, when it says everyone was amazed, literally it says they received ecstasy. It's a fascinating phrase. Uh, ecstasy um, has a, a bad connotation in our culture because it's become a, a, attached to an illegal street drug. But ecstasy is this kind of feeling of euphoria and joy and happiness. And this is what the crowd received when they saw this. I'm going to go to the balcony. We've got Vicar Brett waving his arms, and he's got a comment or question from someone at home. Ah, it's Mr. Whitmere who does. We do. We have a question from Sandy who asks, do we still have pastors who claim to heal people when they come up to the front, I'm assuming, of the sanctuary? Um, that's a great question, uh, Sandy. Yes, do we have pastors who claim to be able to heal people when they come out to the front of the sanctuary. Uh, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, again, dating myself. If you go back to the, the uh, Little House on the Prairie episode from the 1800s, 1870s, we saw the faith healer. Uh, this kind of thing still goes on, and if you watch cable television and poke your nose around the satellite channels, you'll find these guys. Um, I don't think I'm picking on him because I think he's open in his claims to be able to do this. A guy like Benny Hinn, 
Does that ring a bell for some of you? I know Mr. J uh, watches a lot of those <laughs> same programs I do and kind of shakes his head. Benny Hinn is a faith healer. He has this program on television in which he claims to be able to heal people in the name of Jesus. And there's all kinds of reasons to be skeptical about that claim. Again, we don't want to limit God's power or say he couldn't do this, but in the way that it's done in many churches, uh, both in the 1870s and in the 20 teens um, and 2020s now, I'm, I'm not sure that's what it's all about. But there certainly are times and places when God uses his servants to deliver these gifts of healing in miraculous ways uh, I would say that the vast majority, especially in our world where we have uh, modern medicine and treatments and so on, is done through what we would call the natural order of things. Don has a comment here. Yeah, that's a great observation. Don says one of the reasons that the men let their friend down through the roof was so that he perhaps might be in physical contact to touch Jesus. And this is something that um, we haven't talked about yet, but we certainly will as we go along through these other miracle accounts, particularly when we get to the disease of leprosy. Remember, the conventional wisdom was if you were a, a healthy person who was ceremonially clean and you touched a leprous person, that unclean leprosy went into you and you were unclean as well. But when Jesus came, again, he turned that on its head. Now he's the Holy One of God, the clean one, and when he touches you, his cleanness goes into you. And uh, so Don is, is right that in many cases we see in the Gospels when Jesus touched someone, that person was made well or made whole. And that could be what these guys were hoping would happen to their friend. In this case, I don't think we have indication that Jesus touched the man, but we do see power in his word to forgive and to heal. So back to number eight, People received ecstasy, literally, is how it, it says. The NIV says they were amazed. I think receiving ecstasy is a lot more fun and descriptive than just being amazed. And uh, gave praise to God. And this is that same word. They glorified God, gave him the glory. Uh, we also see they were filled with awe. They were filled with awe. Now, um, I am guilty as anyone in Western society of overusing the word awesome. I do that all the time in my texts. Uh, you know, one of the staff members will text me and like, um, I contacted so-and-so, everything is well, or I took care of that detail, and I'll text like, awesome, thanks so much for doing that. We kind of watered down that word, didn't we? Awesome means filled with this sense of awe and wonder. And uh, it often takes place in the context of seeing or witnessing a miracle that Jesus did. That's real, awesome, worthy of being filled with awe behavior by Jesus. So they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is another word that uh, comes to us in Greek. There's so many of these Greek words that we recognize once we start to pronounce them and understand them. Um, literally, in Greek, it says, we have seen a paradox today. A paradox. And I'm thinking that dox is a word that is related to glory, like our word doxology, a song of praise and glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But a paradox in English is something that's like a puzzle. It's confusing. You, you, you think you see one thing, but it means something else. Uh, we have seen something awesome, puzzling. It goes beyond our understanding. How did he do that? We don't know. We can't explain it. But we can believe it 
we can give glory to God for it and say thank you to our Lord Jesus for showing us this miracle. Okay, our time is running short, so we need to go to the Connect section. Uh, this formerly paralyzed man had many blessings. Not only had Jesus healed him, but he also had wonderful friends who went to great lengths to help him. And we've talked about this. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this. How do they help him? Well, they let him down through the roof. What can we learn from them? I think we talked about this before, too. Their goal was to get him into the presence of Jesus. They had faith. They trusted that Jesus could help their friend. Now, maybe they were looking for healing. Maybe they were looking for forgiveness. We don't really know. Maybe it was both. But they knew that in some way, Jesus could help their friend. What can we learn from them? The same thing. Our goal is to get family, friends, and acquaintances to Jesus. We had that wonderful text on Sunday where Philip said to his friend Nathaniel, who is very skeptical about Jesus of Nazareth, just come and see. Come and see, and then you'll know. And he did. Nathaniel became one of Jesus' disciples. Number two. This scripture reading is usually referred to as the healing of the paralyzed man. This is true, but incomplete. Jesus does a number of miracles in this passage. What are they? Do we experience any of them? We talked about this as we went through, so let's do it by review. Things that went outside the natural order of things, the way things naturally happen. First off, the man walked. That's the most obvious miracle in the text. Second, What did Jesus do with the scribes and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? Remember that one? He knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. That's not something that is part of the natural order. So there's another aspect to this miracle. He displayed his divine power in that way. And third, how did he start? What was the first miracle, you might say, that Jesus did that went beyond the natural order, something that only God could do? He forgave sins, right? He forgave sins. Now, if you look at that, uh, have you ever been healed of a paralyzing disease? Most of us would say probably not. And by God's grace, most of us haven't had to suffer that. But does Jesus know your thoughts? Yeah, he does, right? You perceive me when I get up and when I lie down. You know my inmost thoughts, my inmost being. So you have experienced that miracle and do so every day. Also, have you received the forgiveness of your sins? Yeah, those who believe in Christ Jesus have their sins forgiven. You've received that miracle as well. And think about healing. Now, we said before that not all acts of God in healing are miraculous. And maybe there are a few of our... uh, Bible study participants who can look back and say, the only way to explain the reason I was healed or someone in my life was healed is a miracle. The doctors, the medications, they can't explain it. And that is possible. But more commonly is God working through the natural order of things to bring us healing. Again, even if it's not miraculous, it is a work of God. Number three, The crowds of people gathered around Jesus and saw amazing things. They joined the healed man in praising and glorifying God. What do they teach us? What can you learn from them as you read this lesson? I think we can learn to praise God, to give him all glory, to worship him for all the things he does, forgiving our sins, knowing our inmost being, and even for healing us in our bodies in various ways at various times. Of course, even if God doesn't grant us the healing that we so desire and so pray for, we know that we have these other miracles and that in the resurrection, our bodies will be restored once and for all in perfect glory to live with Christ forever. And that's something to keep in mind as a Christian, even if God doesn't grant you that healing you pray for so hard in this life. Finally, the vision section. Uh, Let's go to number one. We're already past our time. You can think about this in your own life, your own circle of acquaintance. Uh, Who do you know that needs to be brought into the presence of Jesus? How can he help that person? Think about that 
uh, as you consider this miracle and your circle of acquaintance. Number two, we aren't only like the paralyzed man's friends, though. We're also like the man who is healed. We've talked about this. We've received Christ's healing, and uh, just as this man did, he left praising God. In joy, he must have told other people what had happened. What miracles of God can we tell other people? Think of ways that you can tell the good news of what Jesus has done for you, especially in uh, forgiving your sins and knowing your thoughts inside and out. And share that in any way you can with the people around you. Uh, this is a way that you become a witness and glorify God just as this man did. Okay, well, we're a couple minutes past time, so I think we're going to wrap it up here for today. I thank you for joining me, and it's good to see all of our uh, in-person Bible study participants back in the pews on this Tuesday morning. Uh, next week, we will continue our study of the miracles of Jesus with session number four. That will take place on Tuesday morning, which would be, what, the 26th of January, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, same, same place, uh, same time. And as of now, we invite all of you to come back and join us in person. Uh, we look forward to having that. We'll also be on Facebook Live and over our telephone ministry. I want to thank Vicar Brett Jones and Mr. John Whitmere for doing the videography and sharing with us all the comments and questions from at home. Let us close this lesson then with the benediction of our Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Salem Lutheran Church and School in Afton, Missouri. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time.